Welcome. Everything is great. You're listening to Fork and Bullshirt, the Good Place podcast. I'm Jason. And I'm Vivian. And we'll be the architects of your journey into the afterlife. This week we're talking about Season 3, Episode 4, The Snowplow. It was written by Joe Mandy, directed by Beth McCarthy Miller, and it aired October 11th, 2018. We have plenty to say about this episode, so let's just get started. Yeah, let's uh, let's hop in our snowplow and shovel some information down people's throats. Okay, sounds good. So, Michael and Janet run through the door to Earth. The key rings, and they answer the judge's call. Jen is livid, but Michael explains that saving the souls of these four humans is important, and they won't be back until they do it. Michael and Janet set up a surveillance room in the university's abandoned journalism department. Okay, so we find out right away that Jen can't come after them because they have the key, which Mm -hmm. is what we expected last week. I did not, however, expect for the key to be ringing, (laughs) which like a key ring, haha. Yeah. It's good. It was funny. It is. You know, I'm still happy to see Maya Rudolph anytime she can be in it for even a few moments. And she still had her arm flapping and that was great. Oh, yeah. So for me, right off the bat, I'm annoyed. As soon as Michael hangs up on Jen, Mm -hmm. the transition between them into the university's journalism department is so abrupt. And suddenly Janet has all this equipment and it just made me upset that we didn't see a transition. Okay. Like, where did Janet get all the money? I'm assuming she got it somewhere. Probably another winning lottery ticket, I guess. Sure. It's just left up to us to figure it out. And she did it all without telling Michael because she immediately tells him. She's like, oh, by the way, I set up the surveillance while you weren't looking or something. Yeah, that's a weird point. Like, Michael and Janet would have talked about that. It seems like that would have happened. Yeah, it's not like I conjured this out of nowhere just now. So now I have to explain it. Right. And that's part of the thing with Janet this season is she's not able to just conjure things out of thin air anymore. So there is more actual legwork for Mm -hmm. the writers to do, but they're kind of not doing it. Yeah. Or maybe they did, but those scenes got cut or rewritten or something, right? Just to keep things moving. Right. Because everything is going so quickly this season so far that... Mm -hmm. They have a lot of story to get through in 20 minutes. Yeah. It's not a lot of time for them. That's a very fair point. That is confusing. It's frustrating. Like, Mm -hmm. it would be great to see, like you said, it would be great to see Janet having to get used to doing things by herself. Mm -hmm. Going to the mall, like she mentions later on. Using money, uh, interacting with people. I do think it's interesting that she mentions in this scene that the accountants are the only ones that have the point totals of um, the four humans. So I kind of wonder if we're going to see them at some point in the series. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because I just feel like they're dropping all these little hints everywhere, like with the memories and maybe now this. I think it could come up this season, and I am intrigued. I hope yeah, that happens. Yeah, like she she says specifically, there's no way to track the actual point values. Mm-hmm. Only the accountants have that information. Yeah. So that's, that's pretty huge. Mm-hmm. Maybe Michael and Janet will have to go to the accounting department later on this season. I hope so. I mean, it's right next to the Janet warehouse. Exactly. Yeah. I did really like in this scene... Janet's comment when she's got the the headphones on she's watching Eleanor and she goes "Ooh, that's gonna cost her a few points <laughs> because Eleanor's farted and blamed it on her chair it just it makes her feel like a sportscaster it's a great moment oh yeah Chuck there oh yeah that's gonna cost her a few points you said that right Janet yep as we see Eleanor leaning to the side we can definitely see her squeak one out and uh <laughs> is she gonna blame yes she's blaming the chair <laughs> Ooh, ooh, bad move. (laughs) I like it. I think it's funny. Now, again with these cameras, she can pan one of these cameras back and forth between Eleanor and Tahani. Like, where is this camera? And why isn't anybody (laughs) noticing just this big camera? I'm assuming it's gigantic. And it's Mm. just like in front of them going back and forth and nobody's noticing it. Yeah, there's literally a cameraman and they just haven't noticed. 
Well, Tahani just figures it's, like, normal, right? Mm-hmm. Like, there's always people filming her, mm-hmm. so it's pretty regular. <laughs> uh, my next point of order. Uh-huh. Trevor's dropout email that Chidi just reads. Mm-hmm. Like, he barely acknowledges it and immediately brushes past it. Like, okay, well, we're just going to move on. That's so sad. What a shame. You know, Esposito, play it. Alexa play Despacito is that what you're trying to say (laughs) oh my god okay so Chidi barely acknowledges it and then the whole group just drops it and nobody questions it like oh poor Trevor thinks he's sad and ugly and stupid maybe we should go talk to him and try and bring him back into the group like Mm. Chidi did with Eleanor that's true I think it's probably because none of them really cared about him or liked him I oh, guess. I don't maybe doubt they're that they're friends. all upset that he's that they're not upset that he's gone, but maybe an acknowledgement like, oh, what a shame. He was such a great addition to the group or something sarcastic or like, yeah. well, I'm definitely not going to miss his, you know, rudeness or whatever, but I will miss his lemon squares or. Yeah, I bet his lemon bars were delish. Mm-hmm. There we go. My question about Trevor's sudden departure has been answered, but it's kind of not the most satisfactory answer. Mm -hmm. I think I would have preferred it if it hadn't been this giant joke. Like, there's no way you would take an email like that seriously. So it's funny because, oh, okay, Michael wrote it and Michael hates Trevor. I get it. Ha ha. I need to believe that the humans would believe it. Yeah, it just felt like, like, okay, we need to get rid of Trevor somehow. Well, let's just have a convenient email. Like, Deus Ex Machina, right? Just done. Even if they, even if Chidi had just said, hey, Trevor sent me an email saying he's dropping out, that's it. Without him saying, I'm too stupid and ugly and blah, blah, blah. It felt like Jason wrote the email. <laughs> it really it did. It didn't feel like Michael wrote it. It felt like Jason wrote it. Yeah. That's not a compliment. Joke's on teach. Yeah. Yeah. So, not great. Yeah. Um, so let's get to our next part. So the group presses on without Trevor. Over the next three months, the four humans work diligently on the study. When Eleanor tells Chidi she needs to find work, Michael and Janet interfere by giving her a winning lottery ticket. How thoughtful. Mm Mm-hmm. Do you ever watch Spongebob? Not really. Why? Well, every once in a while they have these title cards throughout random episodes oh like the next day or yeah. several months later in this great french accent oh, okay yeah yeah so that's immediately what i thought of three months later <laughs> <laughs> and here we go but it would be in a again. terrible australian accent for this show. right i'm not gonna do one nope i can't even nope i can't muster the energy i guess <laughs> i feel like australians just have a lot of pep Hmm. I'm not feeling the pep in my step right now. Okay, that's fair. Um, <laughs> okay, so in this scene, we see Eleanor trying to avoid pointless group activities, like Christmas parties and singing happy birthday. Of course, both of which we see her do later, which is nice. Mm-hmm. Um, but I really like Simone just telling her straight up, just get over yourself. Yeah. Have a cupcake. It's really not. Yeah, you're making a huge deal out of something tiny. We already are a group. Mm -hmm. Just eat a cupcake. It's just a cupcake. There's no subtext. There's no hidden meaning. It's just some pastries. It's not subtext by Calvin Klein. Exactly. (laughs) So just have a cupcake. It's a baked good. Is that a difference between a pastry and a baked good? No, they're the same thing. I think. Okay. Patissiers. Patissiers. Come at me, bro, if they're not. <laughs> um, I just, I think it's nice. I really like Simone. I think she's the perfect amount of blunt, you know? And we see that again later on in the episode, which is great. Mm-hmm. So in our first three-month time jump, we see... Barf. <laughs> okay. We see Chidi teaching them about Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. So he's moving through the classics at this point, maybe a little bit slowly. I feel like those three could be covered in, you know, a week. So whatever. Well, we got to look at our group. 
That's we've true. got Jason. That's true. We really we've gotta got to slow it down. <laughs> Eleanor. We've got Dahan. You has to stop and look in the mirror every four seconds. So. Right. Yes. Narcissus. She's like Alyssa Edwards. Oh my goodness. Oh my <laughs> goodness. She is. I love it. Okay. That just made me like Tahani a little more. Is that bad? No. Anyway. Okay. So tell me about the the barf about the three month time jump. Well, I'm not loving the time jumps. Okay. I didn't mind them in season two. Because we saw all the reboots in the first couple episodes, and that was fun. Mm -hmm. We were just getting a montage of Michael restarting the experiment. We weren't missing character growth and development. They were just quick, like a couple weeks, maybe a month here. But we always went back to the beginning, so we knew that there was going to be another reboot over and over and over again. So we didn't Mm -hmm. feel like we were missing much. And now suddenly there's three months gone that... We didn't get to see anything. Mm-hmm. We just saw like a quick snippet of them. Yeah, we see that they're working hard. They're studying. That's pretty much it. So in the this only first time jump. Yeah, and it's for me. It's frustrating because I like these characters and I like to see their growth. Mm-hmm. But the only reason I can see Michael Schur doing it this way is because it's not important. It won't matter this season. Okay, so their so moral their growth, development on Earth doesn't matter? Right. That's the only reason... That's one of the reasons I can think of that they just keep skipping over it. Because we don't need to see it. Because it's either not important, or it's not important for us to see it because they're going to show it later on with the point values, or which I would not be happy with. No, I don't want to just see point values that say... You're like, hey, look... Look how much they've grown over these nine months. Exactly. No, we need to see it. We don't need to be told. We need to be shown. Right. Unless. Unless we are going to be shown, which is what I am hoping for. Or it doesn't matter. I can't imagine that it doesn't matter. I know, right? So. But that's. No, The show always surprises me. That's true. So it's kind of weird, though. Like thinking about it like that. Mm Mm-hmm. And I'm still not sure my feelings on the whole time jump thing. Mm -hmm. I just know that I'm not happy with it. Yeah, I had the same feeling. This kind of like, oh, no, 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 no. What are we doing here? Can we please have just one episode where we, you know, keep things in this time? I'm going to talk a little bit later about this, but when it's a bit more relevant. But Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So a couple of funny little things. When the three months have passed, we see a couple of post-it notes now popping up in Michael and Janet's office. Mm -hmm. And I liked some of them. I thought it was cute. They have Tahani's primping again. Jason (laughs) looks sleepy, which apparently is relevant enough to note. Um, Tahani looks in a mirror 35 times. So she is Alyssa Edwards. It's canon now. Jason mentions the Jaguars, and there's several little lines indicating that I couldn't count how many. And Jason is very cute, smiley face. And I agreed, but for the one in front of me. Um, Yeah, so cute little notes. I mean, some of them are actually interesting, like Tahani looking in a mirror several times just goes to show she's still vain. You know, she's still thinking a lot about her appearance. She's not really thinking about her impact on the world yet. Mm -hmm. All the other ones are just kind of silly. Like Jason mentioning the Jaguars. Liking sports, loving sports does not make you a bad person. No, of course not. So how does that matter in terms of his moral development? It's kind of like someone's a habit or a tick that they have that, you know, if if it's entertaining enough, then you start noticing it and... It could be like that one person in your workplace that does a something specifically or always when they're talking, they wave their hands emphatically or something like that. And you start to notice it more often. So you're like, oh, I'm going to make a little check mark every time. They should do that for the judge. Hmm. Jen waves her arms around a lot. Check. Check. Jen hits on Chidi. <laughs> check. What would we check. have for Michael? Michael resets everything. <laughs> check, 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 check. Yeah. Janet mentions how cute Jason is. Yeah, check, exactly. Check, 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 check. See, it's, it's just... Talks about his butt. Check, 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 check. <laughs> yeah. Okay. 
Uh, another thing I noticed is when they go to the coffee shop to get Eleanor's winning lottery ticket, there's a big sign for a lottery called Hugh Jackpot. <laughs> <laughs> I missed that one. <laughs> yeah. The slogan is, that's not a jackpot. This is a jackpot. And I have no idea what that's from. Well, it's the it's the Crocodile Dundee that we were talking about last week. The, that's not a knife. That's a knife. Oh, okay. Yeah, people always misquote it. That's not a knife. This is a knife. But that's not actually what he says. Mm. He says, that's not a knife. And then he pulls out a bigger knife and says, that's a knife. Mm. Okay. Also, next to the cash register, they had a sign that says, please finish all phone conversations before placing your order. Oh, yes, please. Yeah. So I thought that was kind of nice. Obviously, Australia is trying to help everyone be better people because... It's super annoying to try to talk to someone while they're also talking to someone else on the phone. Yeah, and if they come up to the cash and they're on their phone, you just, you don't even have to say anything. You just point to the sign Mm -hmm. and turn around. Ooh, I like it. I feel like this Ken person who is talking to Janet really could just convey that much sass. I like it. Mm -hmm. I like it. It's good. Mm -hmm. And another thing is that I love Janet telling people about things. Just like, (laughs) hey, the key slid under the cash register and your aunt is actually your mom. And then later saying, you need to read poetry to your ex-wife. Go to her! So good. I could just watch, I think, a whole episode of Janet just going up to people and telling them strange things. Just Janet talks. Yeah. Yeah. I just, it's it's really cute. It's very funny. Darcy Carden does it so well. And I think it's really in character for her because she's saying things that she believes will make their life better, which is her whole purpose. Yeah, and she doesn't realize it's kind of off-putting or a little bit weird that Mm -hmm. she knows all these details. That's not what she's thinking about. It wouldn't be off-putting in the afterlife. Maybe she hasn't figured out that it is off-putting on Earth. Mm Mm-hmm. So I think it's really fun. We're seeing a little bit of the old Janet here. Like she hasn't completely changed. It's not like we've lost all of her fun AI type charm. So Mm -hmm. I was holding on to that this episode. Holding (laughs) on to that. So let's talk a little bit about Michael's snowplow analogy. Okay. It sounds great, but Michael actually doesn't realize that Eleanor or the whole study group need the snow metaphorically speaking so michael's plowing away all these things that are getting in what he thinks is their way like he thinks these things are impeding them and stopping them from Mm -hmm. doing what they need to do but what they actually need to do is just encounter these problems and use their experience as growing you know philosophers or you know taking what they've learned and putting it to use Absolutely. So if Michael's getting rid of all these obstacles, then how are they supposed to learn? How are they supposed to practice what they're being taught? How are they supposed to grow and become better people when there's no when there's no interference with life? Mm-hmm. Um, I was watching Crazy Ex Girlfriend earlier, Woo-hoo! and uh, there was a quote from a character. This is there's no spoilers or anything, um, and I thought it was really fitting. Greg says. Life doesn't happen to you. You make decisions. Mm. Michael isn't letting the group make decisions. He's handing everybody everything on silver platters. He's giving Eleanor tons of cash. Uh, He's giving them supercomputers. And he's just making everything too easy for the whole group. Right. Without challenges, how are you supposed to learn? How are you supposed to adapt and grow? Exactly. You can't. It's like parents who refuse to let their child fail in any way so they fight all of their battles for them right and then their child gets older and can't manage they can't function life they get rejected once and they just think the world's against them and give up it's classic michael thinking he's doing the right thing and that's absolutely it like michael in season one was ready to do absolutely anything because whatever ends justify the means and they weren't good ends right (laughs) they were bad obviously torturing humans obviously yeah um but now this season he figures hey i can go back to being really controlling like i was in season two constantly 
resetting things or changing things because they're not working out like I wanted. But he thinks it's okay now because he's doing it for a quote unquote good reason. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm just resetting stuff to save the humans, so it's fine, right? No, you need to learn to let go. If you keep resetting everything, they can't grow. Mm -hmm. They can't learn. I feel like Michael needs to listen to our podcast to just get some real down-to-earth advice. Yeah. Tune in there, bro. Yeah. Come on. It's (laughs) demon-friendly. Okay. Shall we continue? Another three months pass, and Michael continues to interfere. When Tahani says she plans to sleep with Jason, Michael and Janet interfere by creating a chance encounter with her ex-boyfriend, Larry Hemsworth. And when Jason wants someone to watch the Jaguars game with him, Michael and Janet create a Facebook group. Okay, so more meddling. More meddling. I like that word, meddling. So much meddling. I remember someone online, and I really can't remember who, said that they wanted a holiday episode at some point this season. Because now they're on Earth and they can do that. Mm -hmm. We get like a tiny glimpse of a holiday episode. Yeah. And I think it is really cute how over the top Michael and Janet are. I in wanted their to office. see Michael getting excited about like, oh, it's it's Christmas time. I can buy decorations. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna hang the stupidest crap on the walls. Like, oh, people love this stuff, and you know, just getting overly excited about tinsel or mm-hmm. spray snow or you know, oh my gosh. the tiny little Christmas villages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's nice to see that, and then compare it to the humans who are sitting around eating Chinese food, just laughing. And the only person who's wearing anything Christmas related is Eleanor. Yeah. She's wearing like Go this figure. tinsel crown with little antlers. And it's really cute to see her spend a Christmas with people she loves because we know from what she said before, she spends them alone or breaking into celebrities' houses. <laughs> so... yeah. This has to be, like, her top Christmas ever. Oh, yeah, easily. I bet this is her top year. Yeah. It's really funny to see Jamila Jamil say mad horny. (laughs) I loved it. I thought it was so cute. (laughs) It is. Um, And it's fun to see that Tahani chooses Jason. She doesn't decide, hey, I'm going to go out to a bar and try and meet somebody Or something to that effect. She just decides, hey, he's cute. He's available. I'll take him. Mm -hmm. And then also to see Janet be mad horny in this episode, too. Talking about getting Jason some jean shorts and looking at her face. And she's got sort of her fingers up, like, thinking about touching those shorts with Jason. And I just think it's, it's very interesting to see Janet so... In love. So human. Yeah. Seeing the emotions on her face and everything. Well, it's a huge difference to season one when Jason was trying to figure out how to have sex with Janet. Mm -hmm. Right? And he's like, oh, we did a bunch of stuff and it almost turned out to be sex. And now, (laughs) clearly Janet wants all of that stuff. She wants to try again. Oh, yeah. She is back on this train. Choo-choo. So when Tahani mentions that she dated a football player, she's talking about the New England Patriots quarterback, Tom Brady. Cool. I had no idea because she said Giselle something and I was like, yep, don't know that person. Bunchen? Yep, don't know that person. Who is that? Now Tom Bra- to know. <laughs> Tom Brady wasn't her type, of course. Uh, mm. So she set him up with Giselle Bunchen. When she says Giselle and like... The slightly desperate glances to Eleanor, hoping that she's going to get a reaction from her, Mm. is, like, my favorite part of Tahani. Like, (laughs) these little tiny, like, are people going to get what I'm saying? Are they going to know who I'm talking about? If they're not, I'm going to tell them. Because, like, they have to know how cool I am, how I'm friends with all of these celebrities. It's just something I've come to love about Jamila Aljamil's acting. Just these tiny little nuances that speak volumes about her character. And it's just... It's so great. I absolutely love it. She's so much more of a dork than people realize, I think. She's so... Oh, yeah, for sure. I don't know, desperate to impress people, but in this really dorky way and not really like a condescending way, just a 
Like, yeah, I know. I get it. Don't worry. I get it. <laughs> um, Giselle Bunchen is a Brazilian supermodel. Mm. She was one of the top paid models in 2014, I believe. Okay. Yeah, she was mad popular. Mad popular. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then, like you were saying earlier, when Janet sees Tahani say she's mad horny, like, her face is just mm. crushed. Like... How can... There's no way somebody is going to get with my Jason. Aw. It was it was kind of... She was getting a little possessive. Oh, yeah. A little bit. <laughs> a little bit. So what do you think about Tahani and Larry? <laughs> Larry seems like such a, a wuss. Yeah. I mean, obviously. He's meant to be. For some reason, it just, he doesn't seem like the type of guy that Tahani would go for because he's pathetic. I mean, he's successful, he's good looking, but his personality is like, like he said, a rock. He's a wet blanket. He is a wet blanket. He's like he's a just, huge downer. He's a big downer. Yeah. So like conversations with him would suck. Mm -hmm. Unless you decided not to talk at all about his brothers, which... Maybe is the only time he shines, right? If you just pretend like Chris, Liam, and the other person. Luke. Luke, sure. <laughs> as long as you pretend that they don't exist. Just like when Tahani says, you know, as long as you don't mention my sister. Mm -hmm. Which Jamila like delivers that line so well. It's hilarious. I think I just like kept rewinding and watching it <laughs> over again. Um, I mean, they're well suited only because of that. Like... Well, I guess not only. They're both successful and attractive, blah, blah, blah. But they're well-suited because both of them feel overshadowed by their more successful siblings. Well, in Larry's case. But it's just kind of a one-note thing, right? Like, there's, there's no depth to Larry. He's just a running gag of... Oh, look, it's that super attractive guy who has body dysmorphia and self-esteem issues at the wazoo. Mm -hmm. Like, Tahani doesn't have those things, so then he just looks so much more pathetic next to her. Maybe she likes that, that she feels like she looks so much better when she's near him. Oh, goodness, maybe, yeah. Like, well, every girl sad. group has an ugly friend, or, you know, Aww. that's the cliche, right? Right, yes. The cliche. Thank you for saying that. Well, yeah. <laughs> not it's truth. not the truth, but yeah. that's what everybody is, you know, yeah. they show in the movies and all that. Yeah. So. So this is my favorite part when Janet yells, uh, go to her. And also because Darcy Carden is in a button up shirt and a tie and it really works for me <laughs> on like so many levels. She looks real good. Plus we get yeah. to see the person that works at the restaurant actually acknowledge that some random person is working behind the bar, which yeah. we didn't get last episode. So it's nice to see it there. A little bit of, uh, who are you? Do you work here? Like what's going on? Where like, did you come from? I have never seen you before in my life. Yeah. Jason obviously gets over the fact that Tahani stands him up. Oh yeah. I mean, all he... the alcohol and body pain is just. Yeah. He probably forgot pretty quickly. Yeah. And, when he leaves the room to go barf so he can get ready to study again, mm -hmm. he shouts Duval, and mm -hmm. I had no idea what that was all about, so I looked it up, and that's in reference to the Duval County, which makes up the majority of Jacksonville. Yeah, I was listening to The Good Place, the podcast, earlier this week, and I guess the writers of The Good Place have been getting a lot of comments because at the real Jacksonville Jaguars games... They scream out, Duval, Duval. And since Jason wasn't saying that, it made him seem like he wasn't a real fan. Mm -hmm. So they wanted to put that in. So they threw that in. That's good. Make sure that Jason really conveyed that he is a true and loyal Jaguars fan. Absolutely. So. And a little bit of fun trivia. Apparently when Blake Bortles was drafted in 2014, he thought that fans were booing him when they were in fact just shouting Duval. So that was kind of neat. So he's like on Jason level of intelligence. <laughs> That's what you're telling me. Duval, Duval. Suddenly 
becomes blue? I'm sure it sounds a little different when you're, you know, in the stadium and there's like a million fans screaming. At- well, okay, maybe it's Jacksonville, so maybe there's right? like a hundred fans. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know sports numbers. We don't know anything about sports. I'm sorry if we just offended you. Like four times in a row. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, let's skip ahead six more months. Yeah, because we're doing that again. That's fun. Six months pass and Tahani is engaged. She announces to the study group that she will be returning to England to plan the wedding, and she's throwing a bon voyage party for them. The Brainy Bunch attend the party, with Michael and Janet disguised as caterers, and Chidi says that they've hit a natural stopping point with the study. Eleanor is upset. She doesn't want it to end. Michael gives Eleanor advice to be honest with the others. Okay, so this is more of our meat and potatoes part of the episode. Okay. So during the montage, the six-month montage, we mm-hmm. see a couple of our characters reading books. And I thought that was kind of neat just to see what mm. books they were reading. Yep. And especially what Larry is reading. You're Not So Bad, A Guide to Building Confidence for the Hopelessly Mediocre. Oh, my God. <laughs> I really want... I kind of just want to put... Like, print out a book. Nothing in it. Just, like, print out a book and put it at the local chapters. Just with that. Just with that. Yeah, just put it in the self-help section. See if anyone tries to buy it. Oh, no, no, it shouldn't be empty. There should be just one, like, the whole book should be empty except for one page near the middle that just says in tiny font, you're hopeless. That's it. Don't try. Just give up now. (laughs) Aww. And Jason Reads Death by Todd May. Yep, and... which we talked about last season. Um, that was the book that Chidi assigned to Michael and Eleanor after Michael had his mid-eternity crisis. Right, yes. Mm-hmm. And in case anybody forgot, Todd May is the philosophical advisor for the show. Mm-hmm. And one of, Yes, actually. one of. And he was on episode 19 of the official podcast. Ooh, yes, yes. He was actually quite interesting. You should, uh, well, actually quite interesting like he's not. But yeah, he was really interesting. You should definitely check out that episode. And Tahani reads Kierkegaard's The Present Age on the Death of Rebellion. Which apparently deals with media saturation. Yeah, I thought that was kind of entertaining, the fact Mm -hmm. that she's reading that. Yeah, well, it seems like it would be relevant to our current time. Plus, very relevant to Tahani, who is constantly in the spotlight, or near the spotlight, or with people in the spotlight, even though she's trying to get out of the spotlight. I don't know. Yeah. While on her Get Out of the Spotlight book tour. Yeah. (laughs) Also, you didn't mention that Jason is reading Death by Todd May while wearing jean shorts with the little pockets poking out. Yeah, I don't get that. What's with the little pockets? It's supposed to be attractive. Why is that like a, Daisy Dukes? Why is that it's a, a thing. Okay. I don't know. It's like a look. These are so short. Even the pockets are too long. I don't know. <laughs> That's the appeal of them. I guess. You just they don't should, know. No, they should just take the line I just said and okay. put it in a commercial, and then everyone would be like, "Ooh, yeah, those are provocative." <laughs> look at that. The, even the pockets are too long. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> <laughs> Royalty checks coming your way. Yeah, exactly. This is how my brain thinks. I mean, they would sell them to me. Not to me, but to me to get for you. Mm, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. Get another giant time jump. So now a whole year has passed. We have three months, three months, now six months. Mm-hmm. Right? It's been a year that they've been doing this study. That's a lot of time. It is so much time. It is... So, so much time. And we get, like, a minute of it. And I feel like it's so much more time than all of the time that happened in the afterlife for some reason. Because I guess in the afterlife, you have this concept of, well, it stretches on for an eternity. So a year in the afterlife doesn't really mean that much. But a year on Earth is significant. A lot can happen in a year. And a lot has happened to them. But we haven't seen it. I don't know. I was disappointed once again to see, okay, another six months pass. Mm -hmm. And also, Tahani gets engaged to a guy in six months? That's quick. 
Yeah. Anyway, whatever. I can Your see choice, it. I can see it. It's great. Um, and I guess it bothers me because Chidi and Eleanor don't really seem that close. And their relationship is kind of... It's part of the glue of this group, right? And they don't even seem as close as they did last episode. Like, when Chidi is telling her that it's over and he's trying to sort of comfort her and say, oh, I'm really glad that this meant a lot to you, blah, blah, blah. He's just talking to her like they're not really friends. Do you know why? Why? Because they're not. Chidi did what he said he was going to do. He cut her out. That's, I mean, that's my headcanon. He didn't become friends with her. He said that would be inappropriate for their study, so he didn't. They only spent time in the study room. Out of the study room, they didn't talk. They didn't hang out. They didn't do anything. But she's saying him happy birthday. And they spent Christmas together. They laughed. They had times. They had friendly times. Jason, don't say that. That makes me sad. Aww. I know. It's sad and it's stupid. Mm. Another part of the reason the episode's dumb. Mm. Well, not dumb, but frustrating. Mm. Another reason that I found the episode frustrating. Okay. Okay. Because that's what I think happened. Uh. Chidi did not become friends with anybody. Nobody made friends outside of the study group. Yeah. He all he kept like a healthy professional distance, I guess. And I think that's why it took so long for them to meet Larry. Mm. You know, there was that little offhand remark of, oh, I finally got up the courage to meet you guys. The legendary study group. And I'm sorry, Larry, there's only one legendary study group. And they're from Greendale Community College. Ooh. So That's you better check yourself. <laughs> okay. So going back to Tahani's announcement, mm-hmm. Michael gave them some sort of magical, like, super board thing. I don't know what that thing is, but I think it looks he spoiled amazing. them. Yeah. I think he spoiled them a little bit too much. How? How did you get this? Anyway. <laughs> like... All of that, writers, you did not address that, but that's... I think they were probably there, just like, let's make this so ridiculously over the top and futuristic that it's just... Who knows? Who knows? Janet knows everything, so she probably built it, is how I'm going to headcanon okay, that. Okay, yep. I could see that. Okay. So, on the Superboard's to-do list, uh, I noticed something interesting. Chidi <laughs> wrote, discuss Jason's... Rawls equals red starburst, Scanlan equals green starburst analogy. I like that. I like that Jason handed in an essay or, you know, some homework that oh, had that. Yeah, he just brought it up in class like, hey, John Rawls, basically a red starburst. Or I'm just trying to figure out, are the red starbursts the good ones? Yes. And then the green ones are the bad ones? Yes. Okay. I mean, obviously. John Rawls doesn't seem like someone Jason would really understand. Yeah, it's been a year. Or relate to in any possible way. Whereas contractualism, which is TM Scanlon's whole thing, seems much more accessible to someone like Jason. Where, yeah, you promise things to people, so you owe them something, blah, 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 blah. We've talked about contractualism before. But then John Rawls is mainly political theory and also the belief that you can't or you shouldn't be praised for things that you didn't work for, like your beauty or your superior intelligence or whatever. These things that you didn't, that you were given, I guess, as a gift Mm -hmm. by the genetic lottery, right? Anyway, the whole thing just confuses me. But I like that he's thinking with food. Yeah, maybe the writer, maybe Joe Mendy is just like, I'm just going to dump out a bunch of funny comparisons and see if anybody tries to analyze it. Because if they do, it's just going to be so wrong. So here we are. Joe Mendy, 
Why are you doing this to me? Okay. <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. And another thing on the super board is tonight's reading, which is Hieronymi and May. And they are both um, consultants on the show. Pamela Hieronymi and Todd May. I'm sorry, Pamela. I'm probably saying your last name really badly. Um, but yeah, they are both consultants on the show. And Pamela is actually a moral psychologist. So that's interesting. Cool. Mm -hmm. And then we had a few other things on the board. Um, in the local news, there was koala exhibit at the zoo overrun by extra koalas who just climbed in and won't leave. So that was cute. Super cute. Yeah. I mean, they're like really going hard with these Australia stereotypes. Mm -hmm. Like really hard. Oh, yeah. I don't think that Australians are loving it. Yeah. I don't think they're able to... For some reason, they're just taking it too seriously. Yeah, it's just a it's just a joke, guys. I don't I mean, know. I think if joke, if they went but... to Canada instead and there were all these Canadian things, I think it'd be hilarious. Yeah, it's just like, oh, ha, ha that's funny. Yeah, we have moose. Yeah. We have beavers. Our money is loonies and toonies. I get it. It's weird. Anywho. And the other thing on the Super Board? Oh, uh, Representative Sackett Indi... Indicted on 231 counts of fraud. So he was from last episode. Oh. In the, the magazine that was like, uh, every guy deserves a third chance. Or oh, every give, criminal every deserves, criminal a, deserves third... a third chance. That oh. was Sackett. Oh my gosh. Okay. I did not make that connection. I was like actually Googling who this person was. <laughs> I was like, is there a real guy? No. Okay. So then we've got this really great super board, and then we see that Michael and Janet are working old school with a chalkboard in their room. And they're making a mess. I they mean, really an organized are. mess, but it's still... Yeah. And you can see that Janet's trying really hard to figure out what their point totals at, are at at this point. And, I mean, it's been a year. Maybe they're just trying to figure out, okay, how much progress have they made in a year? Um, and you see Janet's little equations here and there. But it's interesting to see what they've noted. Like, so under Jason's heading, there's things like bad judgment, chronically lazy, crime is not always the answer, grand theft auto, violence, public disturbances. All of those are really bad. Like, all of those are not, well, they're not good anyway. Um, so is this something that Jason's been doing the past year? Yeah, that's kind of what I think think has been going on i feel like they're marking down things that are happening in that year so jason stole a car is what you're telling me <laughs> and you still think maybe he has a chance to go to the good place i'm not saying that a person who stole a car once in their life is automatically destined to go to the bad place but this long list of things just seems like he's not learning he's not it really doesn't seem like he is right so that's that was concerning. Everybody else has more balanced sheets, I guess. Like Eleanor doing some good things, some bad things, Chidi and Tani as well. Uh in this situation, I feel like they've stopped monitoring and started surveilling. Mm. And to me the difference of that is if you're monitoring, you're just watching. You're mm -hmm. just watching for the sake of watching and the alternative being reporting so they're recording all this information mm -hmm. in hopes to use it later at some point so they can maybe interfere again or keep the snowplow going or whatever so they've in my mind they've meandered they've veered off the path of what they originally were supposed to be doing here on earth mm. which is just watching right they're not supposed to be interfering they're not supposed to be well michael's already been interfering. i know and it's driving me insane that he hasn't <laughs> learned this over and over again it just keeps happening but he's dumb he's a dumb demon mm, yeah. when he's not in his he's highly emotional and he's not thinking logically no exactly yeah yeah one of the things that jason says when he meets larry at the engagement party which mm -hmm. is so did miley cyrus write wrecking ball about your brother <laughs> chris's brother liam <laughs> He doesn't even, like, Chris is, Liam is his brother. Anyway. I thought that was really funny. And I'm like, okay, well, now I got to do some research. Oh, God. 
Uh, before playing Wrecking Ball at a London nightclub in 2014, Miley Cyrus said to the crowd, I wrote this song after somebody broke my heart and I just wanted to say, F*** you. I wanted to write a number one hit, something that would be on the radio. I wanted to make sure every time he turned on the radio, he would hear my song and will keep hearing it for the rest of my life. And then afterwards, when people were like, oh, well, it's obviously about your ex who you just broke up with like a month ago. She said, uh, just FYI, what I said the other night had nothing to do with Liam. I was just trying to rile up the boys. I never wanted hateful things being said about those I care about. I was just too turnt up. <laughs> monkey laughing emoji, monkey laughing emoji, <laughs> monkey laughing emoji. <laughs> so I thought that was kind of funny. A little bit of trivia. It's a very Jason thing for Miley to do. Yeah. So we've got Janet and Michael at the party acting like they're caterers and talking to Larry Hemsworth, who, of course, thinks that they're potentially someone from TMZ. Mm -hmm. That was a great joke. Mm -hmm. Loved it. Um, And then, of course, we see Michael offer shrimp to Eleanor, which is the perfect way to begin any conversation with Eleanor, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. She's immediately on her side when you offer her shrimp. Yeah. And then all of Michael's comments just made me think about the fact that there's so much dramatic irony in this season and we need to have everyone on the same page. Like dramatic irony is like when the characters, when the viewers know something that the characters don't, right? So we're spending all this time seeing Michael and Janet interfering. We know all of the history. We get it. But we have characters who don't. And we got a little bit of that last season in the first episode when, you know, Chidi and Eleanor seem to maybe know each other, but they don't know each other. And we didn't have to deal with that for very long, but this has been four episodes of, like, dramatic irony and so much of it. It's just, it's just overwhelming. I need everyone to be on the same page. I can't deal with this anymore. (laughs) Well, it looks like we're going to get that the next episode. I really hope so. So. Eleanor tells the group that she wants to continue with the study, but they all gently say it has to end, and she lashes out, ruins to Honey's cake, and rushes out of the party. Simone speaks to her outside, explaining to Eleanor that she's never moved past the me versus us stage. Eleanor apologizes to Chidi, Jason, and to Honey, and they make a plan to visit each other every year. Michael panics. He wants to keep everyone together. He plans to reset the timeline, and he and Janet are about to go through the door when the four humans enter the room. Ooh. Okay, so we've got another game changer at the end of our episode. What a surprise. I mean, we come to expect it by now. Yeah. Uh, Okay, so let's back up a little bit. It seems like every season, we have to have someone have a temper tantrum in a mansion. First season, it was Eleanor. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, not exactly in a mansion. It was more in a restaurant where she punched a giant cake. Um, then we got to see her have some sort of awkward apology to a bunch of what turned out to be demons in a mansion. Season two, we got to see Tahani very drunkly ask for the sash and the house Mm-hmm. Um, starts a fire and starts a fire and now here we have Eleanor causing a scene those two girls they really know how to make scenes I don't know <laughs> I do like the parallel of Eleanor punching a hole through a cake right in season one she does it so that she won't be discovered because that would make her vulnerable right mm-hmm. and this is a reaction to being vulnerable she was in that moment when she asked everybody to stay together yeah. And the second she was rejected, it was like, fine, well, I'm going to reject you right back. It wasn't even like, it was literally like after a couple of words from Chidi's mouth, she's yeah. all be like, oh, no, it's fine. Whatever. This is no big deal. You know, you're all about, you're all jokes. This whole thing is a joke. Whatever. It's no big deal. I don't need anybody. Mm-hmm. Those walls, like you're saying, they're back up. And it's, it was the way she said the study's over. We're splitting up. And because that's not something you say about a study group or. Not unless you're from community. (laughs) Or a work group. That's something you say about a friendship or a relationship. And Mm -hmm. Eleanor sees the group as so much more than just a study group. And she's gotten close to them, like Simone tells her later on. But she's actually made friends 
mm-hmm. maybe a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. As no, much I, as she I, could have. As much as we haven't really seen that. Yeah. She has. Obviously, she is attached to these people. And she cares about them. And the idea of having them torn away from her is just terrifying. And for them to want to leave, too. Yeah. That's part of it's, it. She's taking it personally, too. Yeah. So. It's not, oh, we're being torn apart because then she could just argue against whatever's trying to tear them apart. Yeah. Just like Michael trying to tear them apart or Jen trying to tear them apart. This time, it's them deciding that... For a logical reason, maybe they should be done for a while. Yeah, because they're in season two at the end of it. They were banded together and they were Mm -hmm. sticking together. Like, we're not going to go our separate ways to our own medium places. You're taking us all together. Like, Mm -hmm. we do this as a team. We're a team. Yeah, and I think it's really hard to feel such strong affection and not feel like it is being returned. Mm -hmm. It's, It's very hard. Yeah, she doesn't know who she is outside of the study group. So, my favorite part doesn't actually come from Eleanor's freak out in the mansion. It comes when she gets angry at Simone and says, Is that why you came out here? To scold me about the metric system? That's one of my favorite lines so far. I love it. She delivered that so well. Oh, that was... Such a good line. So funny. Oh my goodness. Plus, yeah, I'm gonna scold you a little bit. I don't understand gallons. I don't think I ever will. Get on the level of the rest of the world, please. Yeah, liters and kilometers, bud. So then, as I mentioned earlier, this is another moment of Simone being wonderful. I love that she helps Eleanor here because she strikes this perfect balance of no bullshit and caring right like she isn't about to just make Eleanor feel like what she did was okay she isn't going to give her excuses and coddle her she's gonna point out that it was a temper tantrum and that was ridiculous but also help her understand why she did it Mm -hmm. and I love that I think that she could be a great therapist honestly or at least like a counselor for sure you can see that that's been their relationship all along like Eleanor trying to assert who she is and Simone trying to break those walls down a little bit for her by just pointing out how stupid some of those walls are. Yeah, they're unnecessary. Yeah. They're just there because you're stubborn. Mm Mm-hmm. I really, I loved those two. That was probably my favorite part of the episode. And that whole triad that someone brought up last week, I mean, the thruple, I'm, I'm all for it now. Let's make it happen. And another thing I wanted to point out was when Eleanor said that all the Rocks fans are the real jabronis. Jabroni. Okay. So that word made me think of It's Always Sunny. And then I thought, wow, she would probably fit in really well with those guys. Eleanor joins the gang. Yeah. Or the gang heads to the bad place. Woo. Honestly, I just think Kristen Bell needs to guest star on that show. I think she would do a great... Like, obviously, she's doing a great jerk right now, so she could do Mm -hmm. an even better, even worse jerk. Oh, yeah, I can totally see it. Like, that scene in season one when she's in the grocery store just being a complete jerk. Yeah. Love it. Move along, Lululemon, right? Like... Yeah. Absolutely. She would get along great with probably Mac. So, Michael and Janet are, again, scheming. Mm -hmm. Trying to think of, well, more Michael. He's trying to figure out, oh my goodness, everything's falling apart. What do we do? And then he proposes arson. Yep. I figured out a plan where they stay in Australia and only five random bystanders get hurt. Yeah, It's called arson. It sounds eerily like another trolley problem. Yeah. Didn't you figure that out last season, buddy? Come on. (laughs) We're backsliding. (laughs) But then Janet mind slaps Michael with a reality check. Something that she should have said. You know, a year ago, Janet says that they should leave them alone. Stop interfering. Yeah. Well, she says that earlier on in that scene, too. Just maybe we should just let them go their separate ways and see if they've earned enough points. Yeah. But then Michael says if the group splits up, they're screwed. Yeah. But I don't think Janet completely. He's talking about himself. Yeah. At this point, Mm -hmm. if the group splits up. I'm going to be sad and I'm going to 
be retired, but also, more importantly, I'm going to be sad because I'm going to lose my friends. Mm -hmm. This is the only thing he's got going for him in his life right now. Yes, and Janet, at this point, I think she agrees to go along with his, I'm going to reset everything again, almost out of pity. The look on her face to me is like, you're really sad about this. It's not going to work, but I know it means a lot to you, so... Let's do it. Mm -hmm. See, to me, in that case, Janet is less effective than Simone, who was just willing to be straight up with Eleanor. Janet is not. Like, she tells him how it is, but then decides, oh, well, okay, I guess you're looking really sad right now, so Mm -hmm. fine. Whereas there's no way Simone would just go, well, Eleanor, you're looking really sad right now. So yeah, it's fine that you yelled at everybody and chanted USA USA holding cake in your hand Mm -hmm. so so again Michael wants to reset yep never learning Mm -mm. just demonstrating how little he's learned throughout this entire time and it's sad how desperate he is Mm -hmm. yeah I mean it feels so obvious to, so I kind of just don't want to say it, but like obviously Michael's story and Eleanor's story are parallels, yeah. right? We're seeing both of them losing something that means a lot to them. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, because we've spent so much time with Michael and we've been there through his reboots and all his of crises. His... Exactly. We feel more, I think, maybe for michael than we do for eleanor yeah it's so interesting now that you say that because we've seen michael grow Mm -hmm. and we've seen the group grow we've seen eleanor grow but they get reset Mm -hmm. so there's no growth there but with michael he just keeps growing and changing and evolving he's never been reset this is probably why maybe some people think that he's grown too quickly but i don't think so because he hasn't been rebooted at all Mm -hmm. throughout these hundreds and hundreds of years in the afterlife. Right. It's logical for me that he would change. Yeah, he's becoming a more fleshed out character than anybody Uh, else. Anybody else, yeah. And I can definitely see how that can be frustrating. Mm -hmm. And that's where I want to get to right now is my final thoughts on the episode. Okay. I think I would like this episode a lot more if I weren't doing a podcast about it. Oh, (laughs) I think I would like the season a lot more if I weren't trying to analyze it Mm -hmm. and figure out why people are doing things, why the writers chose to do something. Mm -hmm. And if if I wasn't looking at it so like through a microscope, right, as a casual viewer, you watch the show, you watch the episode when it's on, you don't really think about it later. You just think, oh, well, that was a good episode. Let's I wonder what antics they're going to get up to next. Mm hmm. Whereas us or anybody else who's, you know, investing a little bit more time in it, start to see some either cracks or things that kind of bug them. Mm -hmm. And instead of trying to think, oh, well, I didn't like this episode. I wonder if next episode will be better. Instead of, I didn't like this episode. Let's figure out why I didn't like it. Mm -hmm. Let's find out maybe was it the writing that I didn't like? Was it the pacing? Was it the editing? Was it the camera? Like, what about it didn't I like? So mm-hmm. being on that end, I wasn't a big fan of this episode or this season so far. But I'm pretty sure I felt the same way last year. You did. Season two, I was very frustrated with the early episodes because of the first episode, it repeated itself so many times. And then we had all the reboots. And we didn't have an overall picture of where the season was going. And mm-hmm. right now... We still don't. We're on episode four, and I think that's just the intro to what the main storyline is going to be. Yeah, I think this year is just taking longer to get to that intro because they have thrown in more obstacles in the way. Like, Michael didn't really have obstacles when it came to the reboots. He could just do it as many times as he wanted. Mm -hmm. All he had to do was press a button. Michael didn't have Sean constantly watching over his shoulder, like... Earth is a huge obstacle. It is. Earth is. is And not only that, but we had. Massive variable. We had um, the obstacle of, okay, now the four humans are not actually physically together. We have to get them together. How do we do that? 
Uh, and then, oops, Trevor's in here suddenly. And oops, we get called back to the afterlife. And now we have to run away from Jen. Like Ooh, Janet and Sh- Michael don't have their powers. Exactly. There are so many more obstacles this season. So I understand why it's taken longer or it seems to have taken longer. I'm assuming here that the sort of real story is going to begin. Um, but it makes sense that it's taken longer this season than last season. Mm-hmm. But I, I kind of agree with you. Like, I've I've seen a lot of um, criticisms about The Good Place. Um, even one article was called um, The Good Place Needs Divine Intervention. Like, season three is not living up to the last two seasons. And I've seen a lot of people get really disappointed and really frustrated with the season. I do feel like it's going to get better. I am not sad that I'm doing a podcast about it. No, me neither. And I'm not wishing that i was a casual viewer because oh that's goodness just i hope how... that's not what i meant no, like no, no, what no, it no. came across as no no, um, no that's not what i feel no i am just saying this for uh, obviously the people listening um but that's just not how en- i engage with media so i can't really imagine just going oh hey you know that was kind of a crappy episode hope next week's better like i constantly do this with every show i watch i'm just thinking all of these things mm-hmm. so that's just kind of my life. <laughs> um, yeah, I I do really miss a lot of the quiet moments that we got between characters, and I'm hoping that we get them later on the season. Everything like, feels so frantic to me. Exactly. It feels like... It feels breathless. Yeah. Yeah, it's a bit hard to watch because of that. Um, I just really like actually seeing the characters interact i long for the moments where you know eleanor and tahani are laughing at jason and janet's wedding or chidi is struggling to figure out whether he cares for eleanor or just any of those small like character building and group strengthening moments that we Mm -hmm. had in the past two seasons i want those again and I do really, truly believe that it's coming. I just haven't seen it yet. So yeah. I am marking myself optimistic. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so my final thoughts on the episode are actually something I probably should have mentioned earlier. Um, but it struck me a little bit that um, that this show and also Chidi's study are kind of Reminiscent of Kohlberg's um, stages of moral development. Um, it's it's interesting because he had basically he had he had these different cases where he would tell people stories involving moral dilemmas, and he would present this choice to be considered, um, and then he would test people's answers over a certain period of time. So, for example, he had. Um, like a, a problem and then he would ask you know small children to answer that problem and give their reasoning for for their answer uh, and then he would ask those same children years later and then again years later and then again years later just to see the difference in their answers to see the difference in their reasoning to tr- because people's moral development is linked to their just general growth in life and we're seeing that Chidi and Eleanor and Tahani and Jason, they all start making different choices at different points in their life, even if things have been erased from their memories. And I just think it's really interesting. Um, I like that the study is kind of reminiscent of that, um, even though it's not exactly that. It's just trying to understand, okay, well, you had this life before. So what would you have answered back then when you were your trash bag self, Eleanor? And then, okay, what would you have answered at this point after your near death experience? And then what are you going to answer now that you've had some distance from that near death experience and you're learning more about philosophy? What would you answer? Um, And one of the, just for an example, um, for example, one of the cases that Kohlberg would present to people Uh, was about this man named Heinz, whose wife was dying from cancer. And the doctors said that a new drug might save her. 
and the drug had been discovered by a local chemist, but then when Hines tried to buy some, the chemist was charging so much money and Hines couldn't afford it. So then he decides to steal the drug to save his wife. So then you would ask, he would ask questions like, should Hines have stolen the drug? Would it change anything if Hines didn't love his wife? What if the person dying was a stranger? Would that make any difference? Should the police arrest the chemist for the mur- for murder if the woman dies? Like, all of these questions where you have to come up with a reason for your answer. So, for example, the last one, should the police arrest the chemist for murder if the woman dies? Some might say yes, because this chemist is charging an insane amount for something that could be life-saving, and he doesn't care about helping people, he only cares about making profit. But that happens every single day, and people aren't charged for murder, right? There are prescription drugs in Canada, in the United States, that cost an exorbitant amount of money, and yet the people who make them, the people who charge that money, aren't being convicted for murder when those drugs aren't able to be used in life-saving situations. Anyway, my point is, I thought it was interesting. Definitely look up Kohlberg's moral development stages. It relates a lot to this show, I think. There was a a reality show, a television show that it was a similar but not the same premise. Um, Basically, it was a hidden camera and they would have people in these questionable situations and they would watch how bystanders would react Mm. in like if they saw somebody shoplifting or if somebody was in a store um, being harassed if they would speak up or if they would uh, stay quiet or if someone you know if someone was injured and they needed help and people walked by or did somebody stop and help them like it was just interesting to see how people reacted and differently what show is this I wish I could remember the name of the show or whether it was YouTube or actually on TV, but it was really interesting to see how different people would react in those different situations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I feel like that's what we're getting partly through this show. And I mean, I find that interesting for sure. Hopefully the rest of the audience does as well. There's a, a series of movies or a series of films called the... 7-Up series, I believe, where uh, there's there's one called 7-Up, 14-Up, 21-Up, 28-Up. Every seven years, this mm. filmmaker and this film crew would interview the same group of people. Mm. So when they were seven years old, they were interviewed and asked all these questions and, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? What are your dreams? All that. And then seven years later, they came back and asked the same people again and again and again a bunch of times so it was really it's kind of like that situation that you were talking about except that they weren't morality questions they were just mm-hmm. questions about life in general and yeah what they want to do when they get older but it's it's interesting to see how their responses changed as they grew up and got older and what they thought about life and love and, mm-hmm. and marriage how those things and, change yeah how they change people we as... have an opportunity to track someone's growth right we don't normally do that in our life yes we notice change when we think hard about it but it's It's so gradual usually that we don't notice like a sudden like but anyway that brings us to the end of fork and bullshit a multiverse radio production if you like the show please leave us a rating and a review on itunes this is the best way for others to find the show and if you want to get in touch with us we're on twitter at multiverse radio and on facebook at multiverse radio podcast We're also on YouTube. Just search Multiverse Radio. Mm. You can also email us directly from our website at multiverseradio.ca. Yeah, CA, because we're Canadian, eh? (laughs) (laughs) Thank you so much for listening. Bye. See you next week. Bye. Both of them feel overshadowed. By their siblings. I said overshadowed funny. I was like, overshadowed. Um... Both of them feel overshadowed by their... Did I say it funny again? I feel like I can't say that word now! Okay. 
both of them feel overshadowed by their more. Uh, fuck my that, fucking that was life, more. man! That was uh, more. Uh, okay. You said overshadowed, fine. Okay. Both of them. Fuck off! You're watching me! Okay. Oh. <laughs> Shut up. I've never been this angry in my life, which is the age of the universe. Good Great line. Lines. Good line. I'm, I want to use that on my future child or children. I just want to pretend like I've been around for forever. And somehow them putting macaroni all over the floor is the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, Good. That's you'll, what I want. you'll never exaggerate. No. Never. Never in a thousand years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Michael panics, and he wants to keep the... Michael panics. He wants to keep the... <clears throat> Michael panics! Michael panics. Michael panics? Simon... Simone. <laughs> Simone speaks to her outside, explaining... Wow, you just have a lot of saliva. I can hear all of it right now. 